<laughs> well, I think, you know, then to say run it in downtown Sydney. But I think uh, from the program that uh, uh, Stanley sent me, it obviously a lot of it is to do with your uh, ability to cover the budget well, and um, you know how you should uh, uh, how you should report on it, in in taking into account the fundamental principles of what a budget is. So what I want to take you through is um, highlight some of the key features of the budget in respect of some of the key principles. So we start with the first one. Uh, what is a budget? In simple terms, a budget is a uh, budget articulates the government's plan expenditure, revenue, and financing for any fiscal year. Now, when I say fiscal year, this, this, this is also not a laughing matter. But a lot of people, when I say fiscal year, they think P H Y S I C A L, physical. A lot of people, in fact, the public don't understand the difference between physical and fiscal uh, year. Fiscal year, of course, is your is the your your budget year. In our case, is of course from the 1st of August to the 31st of July. And in that budget, and uh, did we bring the book? Um, the book? So essentially, this is the budget for 2018-2019. In the budget, you'll also see in the first page, uh, you'll see it says the estimated revenue and where is revenue going to be collected from? Your direct taxes, indirect taxes, other forms of revenue, your operating receipts, which means how much you're collecting, your investing receipts, and total estimated revenues, 4.2 billion. Right? Then you have estimated expenditure, operating expenditure, capital expenditure. I hope you know the difference. Expen uh, operating expenditure is what is actually required to run government on a day-to-day -day basis, and normally operating expenditure is something that when you spend, you don't get anything in return. Like it's gone. You don't see it anymore. Classic wages. We pay wages. There's, you don't sort of see a building after you pay wages. That's what's being paid to people. Uh, we've come here in the car. The fuel for the car is your operating expenditure. You know, then you have your capital expenditure, which is $1.8 billion, which is the money that you spend to build things. Infrastructure. It could be investment in digital connectivity, could be you know schools, hospitals, health centers, whatever it may be, roads, etc. But <coughs> budget is not only about from one year to the other year. Budget is more than that, which is a budget is the single most important economic tool for any government as fiscal policy is direct influence on the lives of everyone. Provision of public goods. So which home, which village, which area will get connected to electricity, to water, to Tarsil roads, education, your defense, your police, etc., your correction services. And then, of course, you're promoting inclusive economic growth and socioeconomic development. So what kind of policy measures are you going to put in place to ensure that you have you know, economic growth? What kind of incentives will you provide? What kind of environment will you create? And of course, maintaining macroeconomic and fiscal stability. There needs to be consistency. When you have budgets, there needs to be consistency in your planning, consistency in your budget from year to year. You cannot have dramatic changes. So you can't, for example, one year have the duty on cars you know, at 40%. Then the following year, you have it at 0%. The next year, you have it at 25%. Then the following year, you may reduce it to 0% again. It creates inconsistency. In policy. <clears throat> so the people importing cars also don't know what's happening. There's no consistency in how you actually <coughs> uh, creating that sector of the, uh, of the economy or developing it. Maintaining macroeconomic fiscal stability, very important. The big picture, making sure there's stability. You don't, for example, spend like, you know, one year, decide, oh, we're going to spend lots of money now. There may not be any specific reason. And then following year, you don't or you keep on spending too much every year. I mean, if we listen to everybody, frankly, everybody in Fiji wants a Tashil road. So if we go out and borrow, borrow lots of money just to Tashil all the roads, I mean, 
frankly, it's not possible to physically tassel all the roads in one year. There's not enough companies locally, etc., to do that. Or even if in boring companies, it would be very expensive. But assuming you did do that, the deficit can go up to 20%, 30%. You're going to borrow lots of money. Then, of course, some people start talking about a lot of debt. So you need to ensure that there is actual stability in what you are actually rolling out. And that's been one of the, I suppose, hallmarks of what we've been trying to do. Redistribution of income tax, of income, sorry, taxation, social spending. Now, a lot of people don't understand this. When we collect taxes, it's actually one way of redistributing wealth. So we have what we call in Fiji a progressive taxation system. So the more you earn, the taxation levels are higher. So you then are able to, when you collect those taxes, what do we do with it? We now have disability allowance. We have food vouchers for rural pregnant women. We build uh, homes for old people. That's one way of redistribution of wealth. So you're taking from people who can afford to pay the taxes, then you're giving it to people who actually don't have any social network free education. This is what you call, you know, when we talk about social wages, that's when we refer to social wages. The simple example is a person before, when there was no uh, free education or people had to pay for school fees, a person who was earning, say, $15,000 a year had to pay for school fees. A person who was earning $100,000 a year had to pay for school fees also. So now the person who had $15,000 a year, who actually has less, most of the money goes into what we call your day-to-day -day spending, will, will no longer actually have to pay for school fees. So you're helping them have more money in their pocket. Setting long-term goals and multi-year financing. This is something, and to be frank, many civil servants don't think this way, or have not been thinking that way. We've tried to get them to think. A lot of them think from year to year. They come to the Ministry of Economy, make submissions, and this is what we want. So when you ask them, well, what's your plan in two years' time or three years' time? They don't think beyond the one fiscal year. So we're trying to get people to think long term. So we obviously we put in place a development plan, but people need to think long term. So that's very important for you to understand that, because a lot of the people, journalists, the only concern about the one year. Oh, you're spending this much money. Where are you getting the money from? They're not thinking about what's, what's the plan for the second year, the third year. What are the implications for the next two, three, four, five years? That's what I think is missing uh, in a lot of journalists when they actually analyze the budget. Now, when you analyze the budget, obviously, like anything else, you can look at it, what I call, you know, glass half empty or half full. I've got a classic plan. Can you put the next page? Now, this is very interesting. I pulled this out yesterday. This is the fire, you know, that took place in Sunday. And the... at CWM, where the fire was in the... Um, sorry, the, the boiler room? The boiler room. The boiler room. Now, I, I was alerted to the fire. There's somebody... Uh, this bloke who used to work at Parliament, Ditoko, he sent me a vibe. I said, I'm visiting my dad here. There seems to be some smoke. So I immediately called up the, the PS and spoke to Dr. James Fong. And, you know, everything's under control. We're moving people. The main issue, the fire seems to be under control. And we are uh, moving the patients who may get affected by the smoke. The smoke was the issue. Now, you look at the way it's being reported. Fiji Times, chaos in hospital. Patients evacuated after boiler room fire. Fiji Sun, Blaze contains CWM patients safe. Exactly the same incident. Exactly the same incident. Exactly the same things happen. But look at the interpretation by the two newspapers. How they portrayed it. So, I'm not going to say anything more on that. But when you do your analysis, you as journalists, of course your editors, obviously, and some of the editors I see over here, seem to have a bigger say in perhaps your headlines. But does the story, does the headline actually capture the reality of what is actually, what has actually happened? Exactly the same thing happened. If you read the article, 
I do not think there is much difference in terms of the content from memory, although I, have, I must admit I did not read both the articles in full, but really captured my, my eye was the actual the way that it was portrayed. Okay. Next one please. Now, media has an important role. Balanced reporting of announcement in the budget need to be mindful of the following. Understanding the role of government and what we can do and what we cannot do. Sometimes there are high expectations, but governments are bound by laws that set out limitations and rules. Sometimes people's expectations are very high. That does not only apply to rules uh, and the law, uh, legal precept, uh, precepts, but also what is actually the capacity of government. I just had an incident. I, was just, I went to the mosque and I just came back from the mosque. So, and there was a guy there downstairs. He said to me, he said, you know, I'm from... Uh, that squatter place you guys are developing, Wendamundamu. And he said, you know, they're not building the driveways for us. Can you please, you know, not even say please, can you look into that, like make, make sure it happens? I said to him, I said, you're getting the land for free, 99 year lease, you're living as a squatter, you're getting connectivity to electricity, you're getting connectivity to water, we are tar sealing your roads, you can now go and lease that land, use it as collateral, you're getting a 99 lease, you can go to the bank, give that as collateral and build a nice concrete home. At least you can do something for yourself. You see what I mean? Now that has never happened before in terms of what we're doing with the settlements. We're buying the, we're leasing the land from the TLTB, we've gone and negotiated, we've got the head lease. We're now giving these people subleases, 99 year subleases. All they have to do now is pay yearly lease to TLTB. We're giving them connectivity to electricity, water, tasseling the road. So you see, expectations can be elevated. Now, if you go as a reporter and say, government fails in its duty to put a driveway for the people in this subdivision, I've seen it happen. You have to be realistic about these things. Have you looked at what are we doing already? Uh, understand the fiscal setting of the budget. <coughs> this is very important. A lot of uh, journalists don't understand. They don't even take this into consideration. What is happening outside Fiji? What is happening outside Fiji? The USA just slapped a 25% tariff on all Chinese goods entering USA. China may retaliate. Some big uh, corporate person in Huawei has been arrested. What are the implications of this in terms of a possible trade war? What are, the, what are the implications in a downturn in the Chinese economy? On countries like Australia where they source a lot of their raw materials from. A lot of the mining sector in Australia, for example, is dependent on Australian procure, uh, Chinese procurement or Australian goods. If there is a downturn in the demand, does that mean there is a lower economic activity? Yes. What is our largest source of tourism in Fiji? Which country? Australia, 51%. What impact will it have on us? This is what I have been saying for the past number of years. Sorry? Well, this is what I have been saying for the past number of years. We love the Aussies and Kiwis to come, but our dependency as a percentage of arrival needs to reduce. If you are dependent on two, large, two markets as your largest contributor to your tourism arrivals, you are high risk, very high risk. So what measures have we been putting in place? This is what we need to think about. This is what budgets need to include. But your analysis of the budget, how the budget will pan out for 2019-2020 will also be influenced by what is happening internationally. There is a possible war perhaps or skirmish in the Middle East, what's happening between USA, Iran, this kind of tensions. If, for example, there is something like that, what will happen to oil prices? What will be the impact? What will be the spillover effect? So these are the things you need to understand. We need to understand domestic challenges, financial realities. Generally, you expect in countries like Fiji, many countries, developing countries, Pre-election, post-election is generally a slowdown. People wait and see what's happening, who's going to win, who's not going to win, what's the dynamics like. 
is my investment safe or not? What kind of policies will come about? There's a lot of talk in the market about things like that. Could have an impact on your revenue collection. Now, important to know how to read and understand the budget documents, the budget estimate. This is a budget estimate. The budget supplement. I don't know if you've got a copy of the supplement. Budget supplement is more detailed analysis of, for example, the various sectors, where we're getting monies from, who's going to pay us dividends, which is reflected as revenue. The speech that is given by the minister responsible for economy. What is he said in the speech? They always, at least in our case, we always give a message, sometimes not directly but indirectly. You need to understand what we are saying. Then, of course, we've been doing these things, which are the flyers. Can you move them, please? What sector is this? So, in, so this is the infrastructure. We've been doing this. So infrastructure services sector, social services, water authority of Fiji. How will the money be spent? Read this. If you really want to be critical, I shouldn't be giving you these tips. <coughs> but <coughs> halfway in the year, three quarters of the year, just before the budget. See, it says over here, we're going to spend $18.5 million in the wastewater treatment plant. Where will it be? Deomba, Nambora, Wailanda, Nandali, Olosara, Botua. So you can go into a check. Has this actually happened? Right? Don't do it for this one, do it for the next one. <laughs> right? It says over here, for example, rural water program, rural water screams, uh, scheme, sorry. Naitasiri, Talevu, then you've got the different villages. Wainua Government Station, Nassau Vere Village, Matawa, Matawai Levu Village, Nandovu Village. What's the population? So Nandovu Village is a population of 130 people. The cost for rural water scheme is $71,389. I actually have people that call me up about this. And you said that, uh, you know, you said in the budget over here it's listed, my village will get uh, a 5,000 litre water tank. It has not arrived. Where is it? So that's the level of transparency that you have in these kind of documentations. Of course, rural, uh, rural electrification and Fiji roads. So these are the sort of key documents that are being given. We are currently looking at how to make it a lot more user friendly, easier. Maybe in one document, we can break it down so you don't have that many documents. And talk to the right people. I mean, no, frankly, to be honest, where's my glasses? Uh, I can't see you when I don't have this. Um, you always roll out the same people. You roll out the same one or two economists. And I can tell you most of them have their proclivities. It's a nice way of saying biases. Right? You don't actually, I've never seen you go and talk to an expert in a particular area. You only roll out an economist. And unfortunately, and I've lamented this so many times, that many professionals in Fiji, or some of the people, zero out, already have a political bias. So the analysis, whether it's an economist or whatever it may be, is very, very tilted. We don't get that kind of raw, you know, uh, assessment. So you get a lawyer who looks at the law and says, oh, look, look, I think sections 8 to 25 is really good. But I think section 33 to 7, or 33 to 37, is not actually appropriate because yada yada da da da. We don't get that. Yeah, people generally say, this budget is useless, this budget is good. There's no kind of nuanced approach to analysis, and which you people also don't do, unfortunately, with due respect to all of you. You don't do that. But you're also not encouraging people. I mean, we, we are, you know, post colonial state. We've been ridden by ethnic politics and all sorts of other kind of communal politics. So people also, you know, think, oh, he's saying it because, you know, he's from Tailevu. Or he's saying it because he's Indo-Fijian. Or he's saying it because he's Tauke. Or he's saying it because he's whatever. You guys actually have not, unfortunately, helped us to break that cycle. Even analysis, post-elections, I think some people have fallen prey to that kind of communal way of thinking. So if you want to become a sophisticated society, if you want to have economic sophistication, if you want to improve the quality of services, every Fijian you talk to, so many of them, they want to be like Singapore. 
But what did they do to get there? What kind of barriers and prejudice thinking did they get rid of to actually achieve what they have? <clears throat> Unfortunately, you're not there yet. And I think the media plays a very pivotal role in doing that. So you need to encourage people to come out and do, you know, do that kind of analysis. And if I can just very quickly go, just go to the way we've got all the stuff. Okay. See, how many of you know that the PS for economy is Makarita Konrote? How many of you people know that Isoa Talimaimbao is the head of budget and planning? You don't. I bet you most of you don't. Because your analysis is always very political. Very political. If you go to a good journalist in Australia, they'll know people in Treasury. They'll know who are the guys who are influencing policy. Shri Gandhar, head of fiscal policy, research and other, very important position. These are the people who have input into the budget. Head of treasury, Pankaj Singh, this guy who manages debt. He's about to go to the World Bank for two years, placement. Nilesh, head of climate change, international cooperation, big area. Head of construction, implementation unit. This is the guy whose department runs the rebuild program. All of you said, oh, this school not done, that school not done. Have any of you spoken to him? Have any of you asked what's the program, the plan behind it? You playing politics yourself. Samoni Varamu, Varamu, sorry. Head of procurement. New guy, came from private sector. So you see, you, you don't know your people. You need to know your people. You need to develop relationships with them. You can get inside information. But you only operate at a political level, unfortunately. So therefore, your analysis is very limited. Uh, just next people on the next stage, page. Custom services. These are the people. Advisor to CEO, Director of Revenue Management. These are the guys who are doing all the planning behind that. Reserve Bank of Fiji. These are the key people in the Reserve Bank of Fiji. He's just spent. He spent couple of years with IMF, uh, recently appointed to a couple of the boards, Pattaya. So you see, you don't know your people. You need to know beyond the political. That's when you can do some critical analysis. When you have the budget lockdown, most of these people will be here. <coughs> you don't even know what they look like. Seriously, you don't even know what they look like. So how can you as a good journalist know that you're doing your job well? You don't know the key people. You only know the Minister of Economy and the opposition spokesperson in the economy. That's all. Very limited, unfortunately. First slide, please. <clears throat> okay. These are just the timelines. I put it up there for you. Uh, you know, when we started the, we have strategies approved by cabinet budget submissions. We went through a couple of rounds. The, um, the PSs, the respective PSs meet with the PS. Before even that, the <coughs> people in uh, the respective ministries, the directors, etc., they come and have discussions with what we call the desk officers. Do you know that we have desk officers for each ministry? There's a desk officer in the Ministry of Economy. <coughs> you don't even know that. They do the planning for the budget. Then the PS for economy uh, has consultations with the ministries and, and the departments with the PSs from the respective ministries. Before that, they have their assessments, public consultations, of course. As you know, this year we tried to do something different. You know, all these years, for the past three or four years, we've been going out, never been done before. Stanley, like this one, you go out and meet high school students, university students, never been done before. We've been doing that. But this year, we decided to change it. We have consultations with them. Facebook. <coughs> There's what, 58,000 engagements uh, on the Facebook consultations, but we did have three public uh, consultations where anybody could attend. When the PS meets with the respective PSs, then <coughs> we have another round of consultations over here, where we had the ministers come with the PSs. Then I said, 
with the PS and the team and Shiri and everybody and we, then we go through it. Well, not Shiri but the expenditure guys. <coughs> uh, finalizing budget, we are in a critical stage. So you can see I'm really making, taking my time out to come to the Stanley. Because Stanley and their money rang me up. We print the documents. And then of course we table the documents. On the day of the budget, we table the documents to the cabinet. Reason why we do do that is because we want, don't want anything to be leaked out. In particular, tariff rates. <coughs> As Eleanor would tell you, given her term in FRCS, the budget, when it's presented on the 7th of June, all of this becomes applicable from the 1st of August, except tariff rates. Tariff rates become effective immediately from midnight. <coughs> so at 12.01 a.m., 12.01 a.m. on the 8th of June, all the tariff rates will kick in. Okay, so whatever we increasing or decreasing will take effect from then. And then of course we have by law, <coughs> excuse me, we have to have one week's break before we can debate the budget. So give time to the opposition to digest this. To appear sometimes one week is not enough. Uh, but this when we start then debating the budget. Can you go to the page, the page about, you know, the detailed page we have? Okay. So, I've done, I've read out the first page, right? This is, look, so just, yeah. This is this page here. Overall, big picture stuff. This, this is where you find your net deficit as a percent of GDP. And you find the value of your GDP. Our GDP is increased 100 percent in five, five years, seven years, five years. Five years time, it doubled from 5.5 .5 billion to over 10 billion. That's quite phenomenal. Next page, please. <coughs> now, we'll give you an example. So, I hope you know how to read this. This is just a summary. Do you have another page of this? Okay, so, okay, just go back to the summary page. Okay, so Ministry of Health, that's head 22. Each ministry has what they call, it falls on different head. Head of expenditure, that's what it refers to. Sorry, so... And can I have the, can I have the other glasses, please? So, Ministry of Health, this is the summary page. So, normally what we have, sorry, what normally what we have, you can see over there, you'll have the, um, we don't have the pointer. Do you have the pointer? No. Oh, this is the pointer. Oh, sorry. Oh, shit. So, you see over here, that's the estimate for this. this is the proposed budget, 2018, 2019. <coughs> then it gives you <coughs> the figures for the previous two budgets. So you can do a comparison. So 2016, 2017, we spend the actual, because now we have actual figures, right? 2016, 2017, they spent $90.04 million in staff establishment. The following year, they spent $141 million. And this year, they're getting 134. Then this is the variance or the change. So in other words, staff cost has come down from 2017-2018 to, in 2018-2019, by $6.4 million. You understand? I get it? That's how it works. So we do it, we have a summary for each of the heads. Government wage earners. You know, normally hourly paid people, casuals, 16, 17, 17 million dollars. Following year, 19 million dollars. It went up by 258,000 dollars, 19.6 million dollars. So everything has a summary. So you can see the track of spend, you know, you can track the, uh, the expenditure. Okay, next one, please. Now I've given you an example. <coughs> so, Ministry of Health. Now, within the ministry itself, you have different what we call so health we don't have that one here but it says program one 
policy administration, activity one, general administration. Then normally general administration is like your head office, all the key expenditures that may apply across the board. So you know you've got your biomedical purchase, the construction of the, all the hospitals, etc. is there. But this one here is program two, activity four. So we're telling you how much money exactly you're spending in Lambasa Hospital. So normally this is what you call SEGs. These things are called SEGs, these things here. SEG 1, SEG 2, SEG 3, SEG 4, all the way down to SEG 13. Okay? So normally SEGs 1 and SEG 2 is your, well not normally, it is your, your remuneration costs, salaries. So you see, personal emoluments, that's how much they pay in wages, how much they pay in FNPF. Sometimes they get allowances, doctors may get outside allowance. Overtime, $280,000. We don't like overtimes, right? generally. So we, you know, in terms of some, uh, some ministries are quite good at overtime. So you could then detect, is there some kind of scam happening? Relieving staff, somebody goes on maternity leave, you may need to get a relieving staff. Nurses allowances. This is what SEG 2 is generally your people who get you know hourly rates, etc., your wages. FNPF, allowance, overtime. Then this is your travel and communications, subsistence, hotel expense, freight, cartage, blah blah blah. Well, this one again is your uh, maintenance and operations. So fuel and oil, spare parts and maintenance, <coughs> general stores. Boiler, incinerator, maintenance and servicing. Five <coughs> is your purchase of goods and services. So stores and kitchen items, general equipment, laundry expenses, books, periodicals, furniture, charter of aircraft. Now obviously Lambasa will have it. These people come from northern Lao, etc. Somebody gets sick, you need to fly people in. So we've been now trying to, over the, if you see the trend of this, 10 years ago this kind of delineation or demarcation was not done. So we're now trying to assign expenditure to each of the hospitals. This is only for Lambasa Hospital, remember this. This one is for Tamavua Tumi Hospital. So that's how it works out. Okay, we have any other pages for this? No? Eh? Okay, All right, let's go back to the beginning. <coughs> is the one, right? Okay, so the budget framework. On one hand, we have the expenditure. We normally economy looks at it and then say, okay, this is the baseline. They propose a particular figure. Then you have uh, ongoing and new expenditure. They may come up with new programs. We have consultations. On the revenue side, this is where we generate revenue. We, of course, have to generate revenue. We invite submissions from members of the public. Of course, for that one too. We do the assessment. So, you know, some company may come, like I'll give you a classic example. I mentioned this in Parliament the other day, you know, this company called Pinto Enterprises in Vanuelevu. So they said, you know, we are making this, uh, <coughs> they make these brooms. We are now making these plastic bottles that people can put, you know, cough mixture, you pour it from the big bottle into the small bottle, we're making that. We need protection. So, you know, we consider that because if we don't give them protection, somebody can go in on the cheap, import it for like two cents a bottle from China or wherever, Bangladesh, whatever the case may be. So in order for this factory to run and employ people and create economic activity in Vanuelevu and for us to rely less on imports, we may give them a tariff protection. So in other words, we'll say anybody importing any of those plastic bottles from overseas, you have to pay 32% duty, another 10%, you know, excise or whatever the case may be. <coughs> Then all of that, so it's basically your revenue, your expenditure, cabinet approval, then you have the budget announcement in parliament. Then of course it has to be approved by parliament. Next please. So expenditure evaluation criteria, just to let you know, so you understand. <coughs> so we look at, we have a national development plan. I don't know how many of you have read the national development plan. This thing here is available online. Please read it, good, good reading. It's really good reading. It helps you understand. <coughs> Performance-based budgeting. So, you know, some ministries sometimes will say, <coughs> oh, can you allocate 
$250,000, you got this wonderful idea, we want to implement this. Then you come back, you know, nine months down the track, you've seen they spent only 0% or they spent only 1%. So it did not have a good plan. So if they come back again and ask for more money for that area, we have to critically assess it. So no, no, we don't, we're not going to give this to you now because you guys don't even have a plan. Um, <clears throat> preparatory works undertaken. We've had, for example, people come to us and say, we want to build a police station in a particular place, a police post. Great idea. That's why we're emphasizing on, on um, preparatory works. Then, you know, two years later, we find out it still has not been built. Why? Because the land that they saw, the landowners, and now no longer have, they've withdrawn their approval. So they moved to somewhere else. They may have, uh, you know, not given their approval. So there's negotiations. So, you know, if we say that the police post will cost us half a million dollars and we allocate that in the budget, <coughs> but it's not spent, our deficit is still, our expenditure is still gone up. So now we are saying to people, no, hang on guys, are you sure the land is secure? If it's not secure, maybe we'll give you $20,000 to go and do the negotiations, etc. We'll give you $50,000 to just purchase the lease. Then the following year, we'll give you the money to build. And it may actually take you 18 months to build it. So we should not plug in the entire sum of the construction into this year's budget. We have to spread it in the two financial years. Otherwise, your budget gets blown out, the deficit, you see. You have to be realistic. Of course, you have continuing projects. <coughs> you know, we need to look at that. And realistic cost estimates. That's very, very important. Uh, I have to admit, a lot of civil servants don't necessarily understand that, you know, uh, government does not have a bottomless pit. So, uh, maybe the expectations are quite high. I mean, you know, we of course are trying to, some ministries are very good at it, you know, trying to even hone in things like if we have a meeting like this, uh, some ministries being an old culture, then we'll have afternoon tea. There are 30 people attending the meeting, but we'll cater for 55 people. It all adds to the cost, that's your operating expenditure. We need to be able to rein in those costs. Next one, please. Okay, this little bit of tip of the 2019-2020 budget. Um, like I mentioned, there's obviously a slowdown in the global economy. U.S.-China trade uncertainty, uncertainty on Brexit too. As you may know that we already signed an MOU with UK in respect of our sugar going there. Um, of course, re recent geopolitical developments, global commodity prices, developments vis other major trading partners. I've discussed that with you, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, reconstruction, reconstruction works are coming to an end. Global slowdown, need to build fiscal buffers, expect fiscal consolidation, as we've been saying throughout. Now, the rebuild of Cyclone Winston was about $500 million. Now, most of that is completed. Of course, now we've got some hangers over, would we say, hangers over from Josie, Kenny and Gita. Some places in Kandavu, of course, uh, we're still building. So, you know, these are new ones. This is why climate change is a very significant issue for us. Uh, we'll keep policies consistent, but expenditure adjustments will be undertaken to build buffers. So that's your clue for the budget, basically. Next slide, please. <coughs> Another clue. Again, maintain consistency in tax regime. I see some of the, your lawyer friends and others making comments on Twitter and social media and all of that. Uh, they have absolutely no clue. Sometimes it's very tempting to respond to their silly comments, but they have absolutely no clue what's happening. And unfortunately, people like these actually create a lot of uncertainty in the market too. And frankly, I don't think very, they're very patriotic people because they don't care about the country. We care about the country. We want to build confidence. Further tighten compliance and improve revenue collection by clamping down tax evaders and tax cheats. It's, it's still happening. <clears throat> Take a, I mean, you guys need to be investigative journalists. Walk down the street, go to a restaurant, take a walk from, say, the FNPF, what do you call it, Boulevard. Walk into the restaurants and the milk bars. See if they give you a receipt. See if they give you a receipt. When people don't give you a receipt, you don't know how much money they're making. No journalist in Fiji has ever done a story on this. Nobody. Absolutely zilch. I can give you numerous examples. 
and of course, <coughs> ensure tax and duty concessions are passed on to ordinary Fijians. We are very, very, very keen on this. As you know, I have mentioned this on a number of occasions in Parliament also. We reduce duty, <coughs> like for example, reduce duty on baby products. It used to be 32 percent, made it 5 percent. The price of the baby product went up. Only one supplier of one of the particular brands in Fiji. Despite that, the price went up. So he's eating it all up. So we've foregone revenue from 32 percent to 5 percent with the view that the consumer will pay less. We have a young population. Young people make lots of babies. So we want the cost of the rearing the child to be reduced. But people did not pass it on. So we're very keen to ensure that that's passed on. We put in place a lot of laws in place and FCCC has to do a lot of work in that area. <coughs> Next please. Expenditure policy. <coughs> ensure adequate funding is provided for infrastructure development. You know, you hear the CEO of FRA talking about the fact that bridges are failing, roads are breaking up. These bridges weren't built 10 years ago. 15 years ago, some of them built 30 years ago, some of them built 40 years ago. When a bridge is built, the life span of a bridge should be about 80 to 100 years. You go to the Western Division, you still see the CSR bridges still working. These bridges here in Stinson Parade, Vatuanga, were built in the 1970s, collapsing now. We found, of course, in some places they did not put enough steel did not put enough cement, there was concrete decay. So all these things are coming home to roost. Some of the roads you see with a lot of potholes, if you just dig, dig down, you'll see only about this much of seal. If you look at the base course, what they call the, call the base course below that, it's very clay. They did not do enough compacting. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there weren't as many cars on Fiji's roads. There weren't many big trucks in Fiji's road. So now with the pressure on the roads, it's giving in. So obviously we have to make sure there's enough funding for that. Access, of course, to clean water, electricity is a constitutional right now in respect of clean water. Access to electricity. Nobody, no journalist has ever done an analysis of this, frankly. Nobody. None of the newspapers. I mean, newspapers are the ones that can do a lot of this kind of in-depth analysis because uh, that's the medium that you can do it in. But even TV companies, um, your internet companies, radio stations have not done this. Of course, targeted investment, continuing in education, skill development, improving medical services, and support SME development and self-help initiatives and young entrepreneurs. These are, of course, some of the stated objectives of the budget. Next, please. Again, increase home ownership. We have one of the lowest rate of home ownerships. We have only a 10 to 12 percent penetration rate of insurance. Do you people know that or not? These are the figures that you should be flying off your tongues. You should know this, like you know ABC, if you want to analyze the budget through public private partnerships. Well targeted, effective social protection system. People uh, also fleece the system. There's a lady, you know how we're giving $1,000 per child mm -hmm. if you earn below a particular income level. There's a lady uh, who went, this is a classic. She went to the bar BDM office, same baby, same mother, got $1,000, got in the car, went to Lotoka, same baby, same mother, got $1,000. Drove down to Nandi, same mother, same baby, got $1,000. You got $3,000 for one baby. So, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, some people like to fleece the system, but as you know, we we're doing work with the Singaporeans. You saw the Honorable Prime Minister launch the registration of babies in the app. So, Suva is online. Now, Singatoka, Nandi, Lotoka, and Ba will be online in the next three to four weeks. So, going forward, we're building in the system. So if somebody comes with the baby in bar, baby's name, mother's name, immediately everybody else in Fiji will know that this baby and the mother have been given the thousand dollars. So <clears throat> social protection system is good, but we need to make sure that people aren't fleecing the system. Support agriculture, sugar and resource-based sectors. 
Investment in digital connectivity, we are very big on this, as you know. We're spending a lot of money in this. And we want to continue to spend money in this because that's the way out of these many bottlenecks, glitches that we have. Very, very important. Extremely important. We have a young population, people are more used to apps. How many of you know that there's a government app? You should have it on your phone that you can go today and know what's the phone number of the minister's office the PS, DPS, if they have a DPS, whatever. All of that is there. <clears throat> but we're going very big on this. We'll have some announcements in respect of digital connectivity. Next one, please. And that digital connectivity actually is positioning ourselves for the future. The ease of doing business, all of that is being addressed within the digital Fiji framework. Very, very important. Okay, now these are what I call the easy areas of politicization, economy and debt. I said obtain opinion from truly independent people. The ANZ report just came out. You need to talk to people like them. That man actually who's done the, who's the economist, who now is based in Sydney, is actually a former Fijian. Worked at the Reserve Bank of Fiji, very highly regarded in the ANZ circles. You need to talk to people like that. They've got no stake in any political alignment. <coughs> and I'm sure that people like that would love to talk. Next one. Okay, these are facts. What I call the Beni Marama boom. The nine years or decade of positive economic growth. On average, the economy has grown by 4.5% since 2013. Much stronger than our historical averages. Now this 4.5, um, if, you, if you take out the 2.6 growth because of Winston, then it would have been on 4.9 percent per year. But because of the 2.9 or 2.6, it's grown on average by 4.5 percent since 2013. We projected to grow by 2.7 percent this year and around 3 percent in the medium term. Obviously, it slowed down for obvious reasons that I've stated to you. But nonetheless, it is growing and it's not going down to one. Now, this essentially sets out where we had the growth and no growth. This, of course, was GFC. How many of you know what GFC means? Global Financial Crisis. That's when I think US and other countries did a bailout of all the banks to the tune of $86 billion. I was reading some recent figures. And of course, it hit the world all, all over the place. Uh, we went to negative growth, 1.4%. But these are the years of growth. You know, we had, of course, Thomas came, Evan came. Uh, we had Winston here. And Josie and Kenny came here. It's like our friends. Um, so that's the growth rate. And this is the projected growth rate. Normally, projections are done for three years. So you can't project any longer than that. OK, next one. Um, again, debt to GDP ratio, again, again, I have to say this again, and journalists make this mistake also. I don't know, some of you may be doing it because of political reasons, or I don't know, whether, or whether you don't understand. Two ways of measuring debt, as you know. One is your actual value of the, the dollar value of the debt, and the other one is a percentage of your GDP. Debt to GDP ratio fell from 56% of GDP in 2010 to 45.9% at the end of July 2018. Decline of more than 10% of GDP. I'm sitting there. If Winston had not happened, we would have been $500 million, on the face of it, $500 million richer. So this bar would have been even smaller. Now, the dollar value of the debt, 2002, was 1.8 billion. The dollar value of the debt is 5.2 billion. But as a percentage of your GDP, it's come down. So in other words, we've become richer. The example that I've used with the students, if I can use it with you again, if Aliki here earns $100 a week and he goes and borrow $20, so you would say his debt to GDP ratio is 20%. 20% of his income goes, you know, is part of his debt. Yeah. 
this lady who has been filming me throughout, if she earns $500, but she has a debt of $50, two and a half times more than a leakage, but her percentage of her debt as per her income is only 10 percent, even though the dollar value is higher. Who is better off? Is she better off because she has got a $50 debt or is he better off because he has got a $20 debt? Anybody? Who is better off? Sorry? You are better off. Exactly. So, in the same way as I will show you in the next slide, let us go to the next one. This is the dollar value of the debt of Japan in US dollars, 11.8 trillion dollars is a percent of GDP is 239.2 percent, but none of you ever say that the Japanese economy is in trouble. So, we may have gone to there on a goodwill visit. Singapore's debt is 332.7 billion dollars, 112 percent of GDP. USA is the most debt ridden country in the world, 19.9 trillion US dollars. Percent of GDP is 107.4. Now, look at it this way. The dollar value of US's dollar value debt is more than Japan, right? 19.9, 11.8. But as a percent of GDP, USA is far less than Japan. Why? Because the US economy is much bigger. She can absorb that debt. In the same way, she can absorb a $50 debt because she earns a lot more. He can't absorb. If he had a $50 debt, the dollar value, 50 percent of his income is in debt. I hope you understand. So, I I'll, I'll, I'll can leave you the slides, but just go back to that previous one, please. So, this is in US dollars. Let us do some comparisons as a percentage of GDP. That is where we sit. <coughs> Samoa, Tuvalu, these are the countries. Um, Mauritius, Nauru, Maldives, you know, all these places. Now, if you look at Australia, Australia's debt to GDP ratio is less than ours, 41.1. But if you look at the next page, the dollar value of Australia's debt is 517.3 billion US dollars. The dollar value of our debt is 2.42 billion dollars US. You see, the percent of GDP is much lower, but ours is slightly higher, but the dollar value is less, far less, because the Australian economy is far bigger. So, it is your absorption capacity that you need to look at. It is 5.2 billion dollars. What is your absorption capacity? The most important thing, if you want to be a good journalist writing about economics and finance and what have you, is where is the money being spent? Is the government spending money, borrowing money to build things or is it borrowing money to simply do day to day expenditure? So, if we are going to and even when you build things, is it being built to build what we call productive capacity? <coughs> so, if we for example, build, borrow money to build a hundred million dollar <coughs> conference facility on top of some hill in a remote place it will be used only for you know two times in a year it's not worth it you're not getting a return but if you are building it using the same money to give people electricity water etc you're building a productive capacity <coughs> so the guy who sells fish by the roadside he catches fish and sells fish by the roadside if he has no electricity and uh, he has to sell his fish that day. If he does not sell it, he has to eat it himself. Assuming he is allergic to fish, he, the fish will rot and he will not eat it. So, normally when you drive past in the morning, he just caught the fish, he sells it for 50 dollars a bundle. By midday, he is not selling it, you come along, you know you can negotiate. By 3 o'clock, you can drive him down to 25, the guy is really desperate. But if you give him electricity, and he's got a fridge. He won't sell. He won't bring his price down. He'll put it in the cooler in the fridge. Next day, you drive past. He's thrown fresh water. It's a fresh fish for sale, fifty bucks. 
and you'll bite. That's what you call building the productive capacity, building into assets. Next, please. Okay. Have we done this? Anyone else? What else? Okay. So stay tuned for this. I thought do a radio thing. Stay tuned for June seventh. So that's it.